Well, my dear brothers and sisters, and our new sister Zoe. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that our Heavenly Father has established a means by which we can be saved, that he's established a means by which we can become part of his family. And over the last number of months, Zoe and I have been considering God's power and his love and his grace to save. And today we saw my beautiful girl getting baptised. You now belong to a new family. Your surname is no longer Roche. Your surname is now Yahweh Ail. He who will be manifest in power, and you are one of his powerful ones. And one of our considerations over the weeks has been this process of birth, of a new birth. We're told by Paul in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, for all of you who have been baptized into Christ have closed your, closed, clothed yourselves with Christ. And so through baptism, we receive a new birth certificate. We go from being the children of Adam, inheriting the things that belong to Adam, which is death and corruption and suffering, pointless suffering, to being a new child, no longer tied to those things which humanity earn through service to sin, but that we are given an inheritance in the family of the living God. Because you are sons, God sent his spirit of his son into your hearts, and that spirit calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave to sin, but you are now God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. Brothers and sisters, we can't earn eternal life. And we certainly don't deserve God's grace and his mercy on account of our abilities. But we don't need to. And the reason we don't need to, brothers and sisters, is it's ours by right of birth. Have you ever thought about that? It belongs to you because it's your birthright. It belongs to you because you're a child of God and you receive all the benefits and all the privileges and all the honors and all the blessings that come with being a child of God. And once you're baptized, you can never not be a child of God. But we're warned, aren't we? As Peter puts it, we can become cursed children. Children who, like Esau, gave up their birthright. That's a deeply powerful idea, brothers and sisters. And that's why of Esau, God says, I hate him. I hate him. Why? Because he gave up the most glorious birthright. But that's not who we are. And that is not what we do. We, brothers and sisters, and my dear Zoe, are the family of God. We are the royal family. We are kings and priests, as Christ says to John, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. 
Now, I'm sorry, brothers, there's no princes in that picture. It's only princesses, but that's for a reason. We have a new princess amongst us. But it's true, brothers and sisters, we are part of the royal family. Now, we don't have all the glamour and the gowns. We don't have the palaces and the carriages and the horsemen and the liveried servants who attend to our every woman desire. Probably a good thing, because that was the case. We wouldn't be here. But it's no less true of us that we are the princes and princesses of the royal household of David. And our king reigns in heaven and will soon reign on earth. And then we will have the palaces and then we will have the livery and we'll have all of those trappings, but they won't mean anything particularly to us because we will be glorious. We will be our truest selves. We will occupy our new identity. As Christ says, unto him that overcomes will I give a white stone and in that stone will be a new name. And so, Zoe, you have a new name. You have a new identity. You don't belong to the Roche family. You belong to the family of God. But you'll always be my precious girl. And so, brothers and sisters, just like any young prince or any young princess, there's education and training to do. There's learning to be done. And so I encourage you to spend time reading the Word of God, reading the great writers of our faith, and applying yourself to understanding. You need, as a princess, to understand the law, because kings are about law. And as a princess, sorry, as a priestess, as a priest of the living God, you need to be about the matters concerning the priesthood. How to save people. How to empathize with people. How to heal people. And so apply yourself to those things. What I wanted to do today, brothers and sisters, was take a consideration from Ephesians. Ephesians as a letter is an amazing letter. It can be somewhat difficult to understand. But it is actually quite simple. The first half of Ephesians is about the enormous love and grace and mercies of a heavenly father to us, his children. And the last half of Ephesians is about our obligations, the expected response from us. But I wanted to consider, brothers and sisters, this morning, a few verses out of chapter 1. We're told there in verse 3 that we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings. These blessings, brothers and sisters, are the blessings that belong to the family of Abraham. If you recall in Genesis 12 and 13 and 15 and 22, Abraham received specific promises. And one of those promises is that in him all the families of the earth will be blessed that by adoption into the family of Abraham, certain blessings, certain rights will be allocated to those who form part of that family, who form that family. And in Ephesians chapter 1, we're given those blessings. The, the blessings that we have been granted. Now, we're told here that it's not natural blessings. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, we read in verse 3, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, or heavenly realms, as the NIV states it. And so these blessings, brothers and sisters, belong to a different reality. These blessings pertain to the reality of God, not to our natural reality. They belong to God's realm, not our realm. And Christ said to his disciples, well, he, in, in a prayer to his father, he prayed for strength and protection for his children, for his people, that they might be what? 
in the world, but not of the world. And in some respects, brothers and sisters, we live in two realms. We live in a natural realm of the flesh, in a materialism, and of the day-to-day. But so much more importantly, brothers and sisters, we should live in the realm of heaven. We should elevate our minds to the things of God. We should elevate the influences and the way we live our life to the heavenly. And it's so easy for us to be distracted by the earthly. It's so easy for us to struggle with the natural things of life, finances and relationships and careers and children and plans and things, stuff. Brothers and sisters, none of this matters. This hall doesn't matter. Your car doesn't matter. Your house, your boat, your helicopter, your lands, your cows, your sheep, all of that stuff is irrelevant. It's scaffolding. It's temporary. What matters, brothers and sisters, are the eternal things. Now, here's a question for you. What are the eternal things? I think I've asked this question before. What are the eternal things? What do you think the eternal things are? Look around. Yeah. And where is that character housed? In you. Yeah. Look around. It's us. We are the temple of God, not this building. We're the eternal things, not the stuff around us. And our Heavenly Father has blessed us with the things of His reality. Those things which pertain to heaven. Paul says in Hebrews 3 verse 1, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus who we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. And so we come to verse 4, he says, According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know, brothers and sisters, we don't deserve it, as I said. But because of our faith, because we believe what God has said, and we believe that he has saved us, He's given us these things as an inheritance by right. This word here, chosen, has the idea of selecting out. He has chosen us. Now, I hope you like brown M&Ms. But it has this idea, right, of going through and selecting out throughout all the generations and all the different people on the earth a specific group of people for himself. And that is an amazing thing, brothers and sisters. That's an incredible thing. God goes through each generation and he says, I want this one and I want this one and I want this one and I want this one. In Revelation, we have this amazing vision of the tribes of Israel, the 144,000. And he says of them, 12,000 for Gad and 12,000 for Manasseh and 12,000 for Judah and 12,000 and 12,000. Now, the number 12,000 doesn't mean anything. It's not a a literal number. It's not like we get to 12,000 and we stop. 12 being the tribes of Israel and 1,000 being a myriad. But what it does tell us, brothers and sisters, is that there are lists, that there are Names that need to be allocated. There are people that need to be acquired, and they're going to be allocated to a tribe. Now, we are the royal family of the tribe of Judah, but we will be allocated to a tribe of Israel to look after them, to shepherd them, to maintain them. 
And I don't know which tribe you're going to belong to or which one you'll be allocated to. I don't know which one I'll be allocated to. I don't know which one Zoe will be allocated to. But in the kingdom of God, we will make up those lists. And throughout history, brothers and sisters, our Heavenly Father has been selecting people for his name. He's been calling out of the Gentiles a people for his name. And we have a bad habit, brothers and sisters, of thinking in quite finite terms, in narrow terms. We tend to think in terms of our lifespan. That's not the way God works. And he's telling us this here. He says here that he's selected us before the foundation of the world, before the arrangement of the current system, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So that's the purpose that God has with us, that we might be a special people, that we might be a separate people, that we might be his peculiar treasure, that special thing that belongs to him and only him. And so throughout the generations, brothers and sisters, throughout history, he has foreseen us having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself. Predestined to have known beforehand, to have seen beforehand. Now you think, brothers and sisters, if you think about the importance of the kingdom of God, and you think about the importance of the leadership of the kingdom of God, do you think our Heavenly Father would leave anything to chance? Do you think it's just a random thing? It could be like, you know what, just hand out numbers to everybody and then we'll just put it into the spinny wheel thing and a number comes up and that person, if you've got 31, you're in. If you've got 15, you're in. If you've got two, you're in. No. No, our Heavenly Father has had a plan well before the day you were born. He saw your great, 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 great grandparents. And they had children. And one of those children married into another family. And then that family had children and married. And so on and so forth. Each generation throughout all of those generations. Like a thread through a tapestry of history, working its way all the way down to you, to Zoe. Here she is. It doesn't matter whether you were born into a Christadelphian family or like me, you came from outside. God traced that lineage. He mapped that lineage. He predestined you. He foresaw you. And he made sure that nothing happened to any of those people before they could have children. You think about the complexity of that. You think about all the plagues and all the wars and all the famines. One in four children for the vast majority of the last 1,200 years died before they were five. And yet God said, not that one, not that one, not that one, not that one. And you imagine, brothers and sisters, at some point one of them did die, for example. So I wouldn't be sitting here. I wouldn't be standing here. Just think about the magnitude of God's grace and mercy that he has brought you to this point in history. He had to make sure that all of your forebears survived so that you could be here today. So Zoe could be here today. That is an amazing thing. It's an incredible thing. And God has done that. Why? Because he wants us to be his children. 
He wants us to be his sons and his daughters. And he says it's according to his good pleasure. The idea of good pleasure there means he's joyful. He loves to do it. You know, when, you, when your daughter comes home or your son comes home and they say, Dad, can we go down to go swimming? We go, yeah, I'd love to go swimming. Let's go swimming. I'd love to go and do that with you. And that's what God does for us. Because we're his children. So we're told there, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in his beloved. And so our association with Christ makes us accepted. And it's, it's a sad thing, brothers and sisters, and it's easy to fall into this trap. But we and you hear it in prayers. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. God doesn't care what you think. What did God say to, Paul, to, uh, to Peter in Acts 10? And he saw the sheep come down and all the unclean animals. And he's told, rise up and eat. And there's octopuses and there's cats and dogs and there's monkeys and there's pigs and there's camels. And there's spiders and cockroaches and bleh, creeping around. God says, but dinner time. What does Peter say? No. I have never eaten anything unclean. Cockroaches? Ugh. Although lobster and marinade sauces, yeah, pretty good. Not that he would have known, but it's pretty amazing. And what does God say to him? Don't you dare. Don't you dare call common what I've made holy. Don't you dare. Brothers and sisters, we're worthy. We're worthy. Why are we worthy? Because God has made us worthy. To say we're not worthy, brothers and sisters, is like calling common what God has made holy. Don't do it. It doesn't help you to think that way, by the way. It is much easier to walk a holy life if you frame your life in a holy context. God has made you worthy. God has made you complete in Christ. That's the power of the sacrifice of Christ. And we should be motivated on that basis. And so he says here, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Well, well, in what way are we the praise of the glory of his grace? When we walk down the street, people don't go, Wow, Sister Varna, amazing! You are just so awesome! You are the embodiment of God's grace! Well, Brother Paul, fantastic! Look at you! You're incredible! But that's the way God sees it. That's what we're designed for. And in fact, brothers and sisters, there will come a day when that will be absolutely true. There will come a day, brothers and sisters, when we, in immortal bodies, clothed in glory, will walk down the boulevards of the temple of the living God, arrayed in white and gold, and there will be people lining the streets and they will have flowers in their hands and they will see us and they'll be amazed. Who are these glorious people? And you imagine, brother, sister, you're walking along and you see a little girl. And she's all wide-eyed, like a, this is an amazing parade. Here are the glorious sons and daughters of God. And she's standing there with a bouquet of flowers. And she's like, I just want to give them one of these. I just want to. And then you walk up and you see this little girl. And you bend down and you take it from her. And she says, who are you? And you say, once upon a time, I was you. Once upon a time, I was just like you. But because of the grace and the love of my God, I am now one of his glorious sons and daughters. And one day, you will be too.
It's an amazing picture, brothers and sisters, and we need to create these pictures in our minds because this is the inheritance. This is the glorious inheritance that's been given to us. And so he goes on in verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. The word redemption there means to ransom. It means to pay the full price to buy back. And in Roman society, in war, prisoners would be taken. Also European society, you might, you know, Lord, I'm so important, gets taken in battle and carried away. And then the family of Lord, I'm so important, needs to ransom him back. And they'd have to pay money to ransom him back and buy him back. And a ransom, brothers and sisters, has been paid for us. We have been bought back through the blood of Christ. We've been ransomed from the king of sin who, have, who once caught us, under whose authority we lived, under whose laws we operated, and we've been bought back with a price, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we might once again well, that we might become part of the family of God, that we might return to our king. We didn't choose to be under the burden of sin. We didn't choose to be afflicted with the flesh. But we did choose, brothers and sisters, didn't we, to enter the waters of baptism and associate ourselves with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is our association in Christ. Oh no, I've lost my mouse. It's our association in Christ that places us in the ranks of the kings and priests of our Heavenly Father. Now that's not to say, brothers and sisters, that we don't have a challenge with sin. It doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle with passions and lusts and temptations. That's why our Lord says, forgive us our sins. Forgive us for the things we've done wrong and grant us the wisdom and the compassion to forgive others. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us. Sister Zoe, the problem of sin has been solved for you. The problem of sin has been solved for all of those who have been baptized into Christ. But that doesn't mean there won't be challenges. In fact, Paul picks this up in Romans chapter 7. Uh, Romans chapter 7 verse, verse 15. He says there, For that which I do, I allow not for what I would that I do not, but what I hate that I do. And he's describing this conflict, isn't he? If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law, that it, the law itself is good. And now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And he's creating this persona. He's, he's splitting himself up into two people. He's got this idea of sin, which dwells within him, which drags him down and then he has this idea or this concept of the spirit of God and he goes on in verse 19 for the good that I would I don't do but the evil which I would rather not do that is what I find I do now if I do that which I would not it is no more that I that do it but sin that dwells in me and so here is this persona and I find then a law that when I would do good evil is present with me I delight in the law of God after the inward man but I see another law in my members at war with the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver you, who will deliver me from the body of this death? And if we stopped there, if there was no more there, then that would be terribly depressing, wouldn't it? Because, because there's no deliverance. Like the thing you want to try and achieve, you're frustrated to achieve because there's this other thing pulling you back. 
But he doesn't leave it there, does he, brothers and sisters? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And so what's he saying? He's saying, I've been delivered from the body of this flesh, that I might worship God. I've been delivered from sin. Now sin still operates in this mortal body. I still feel the passions and the challenges, but my heavenly Father forgives me through Jesus Christ. And so the problem of sin is gone. And yet for some bizarre reason, we have a bad habit of stopping at verse 24. We have a habit of stopping at verse 24 and going, how terrible am I? How bad am I? I always keep falling over the same sins. I always keep falling over the same problems. I always keep doing the same stupid things. And I don't want to do it. I want to worship God. How bad? I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. It's too hard. I'm going to resign. And it's a tragedy, brothers and sisters. It's a tragedy. that brothers and sisters leave. They get stuck in verse 24. I can't live the Christadelphian lifestyle. There is no Christadelphian lifestyle. There's the lifestyle of the godly, and then there's the lifestyle of the ungodly and the sinner. And that's been true since Adam. Don't give up. God has made you worthy. He's made up your lack. Don't lose confidence that the work God has started in you, he will complete. Don't make the mistake of calling that which is common. Sorry, don't make the mistake of calling that which God has called holy, common. So why has God saved us? For what purpose? Well, brothers and sisters, God has saved us for a purpose. And that purpose is that we might go forward and produce fruit for him. And so in Ephesians 2 verse 10 we read, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has a list of good works that he wants us to do. So here's a list. Now here's a question for you. Where is sin in that section? It's not there, is it? Because that's not God's focus. God solved the problem. Our new sister took advantage of the solution. What God wants is for us to go and do good works. And he's a list. He's got a plan for you and me. He's a list on the fridge of things, good works to do today. And we need to go and do them. Titus 2 verse 14, he says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself. I really need to find this mouse. Oh, all right, okay. There we go. Titus 2, verse 14. Purify to himself a people for his own possession who are zealous of good works. They're passionate about it. They get out of bed in the morning with a spring in their step and go, What good works can I do today? What's on the fridge? Woohoo! Gotta go help some people. Isn't that great? I'm going to go and create some amazing things to help my brothers and sisters. Is that how you get out of bed in the morning? You get out of bed going, ugh, I've got to go to work. Got to get the kids to school. Going to go and have my wheat picks. Or are you excited? Paul says to Titus, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, and be ready for every good work. So they're ready. They're prepared. They've got their tool belt on. They're armed. Like, this is the greatest day to do good things, and I'm ready. Trained myself. Are we ready, brothers and sisters, for good works? The focus, brothers and sisters, should be on righteousness, not on sin. John tells us righteousness is as righteousness does. James says, do you have faith? Really? Show me. 
faith is, brothers and sisters, as faith does. And the tree is as the fruit it bears. And brothers and sisters, when you go and look at a tree, do you go out to the tree and go, you know what? There's some bad fruit on this tree. What a terrible tree. Let's say it's you know, a peach tree and you walk out, right, and there's all these peaches and half the peaches are bad, rotten, and they've been attacked by birds. And you sit there and go, what a terrible tree. This is the worst tree. We should chop this tree down. Is that how you look at a fruit tree? Who has fruit trees? Anybody have fruit trees? Surely somebody has a fruit tree, right? Is that how you go to your fruit tree? Or do you go to the fruit tree and go, wow, good fruit, yes. Let's take the good fruit. That's great. And let's imagine you go out one year and it's all bad fruit. It's like, <laughs> what would you think? Oh, you wicked, horrible, terrible, evil, conniving tree sitting there all winter plotting to destroy your fruit against me. No. We don't, do we? We look at the tree and go, what went wrong? Oh, you poor tree. Oh, what do we, oh, we need to do something. Maybe we need to move the tree into a better condition. Or maybe we need to fertilize the tree. Or maybe we need to wrap the tree up to protect it from the frost or from the birds. We don't beat the tree. We don't chop the tree down. We don't poison the tree. We look at the tree and think, what can we do now? Now, here's a question for you, brothers and sisters. How do we treat our brothers and sisters? Because you're all trees, brothers and sisters. And you produce fruit. It's the nature of being a tree. And I know that you produce some bad fruit. And I know that because I produce some bad fruit. But you also produce good fruit. And so when we see our brothers and sisters, what do we focus on? Do we focus on the things that they do wrong because that makes us feel better about ourselves? Oh, well, look, sure, I've got some bad apples, but have you seen Brother Raju? Man alive! He is so much worse than I am. I mean, that's horrendous. No, that's not the way we should treat our brothers and sisters. Sorry to pick on you, Brother Raju. And it's not, I'm not saying you only do bad fruit, by the way, but just... No, that's not how we treat our brothers and sisters. If we see a brother or a sister who's got some bad fruit, we go, look, what can I do to help? Yeah? I've got a big bag of manure. Now would you like me to throw that at you? There you go. This probably came out wrong. Um, nutrition, right? We try, and, we try and help. Do I need to wrap you up? Do I need to put you in a sunnier spot? Are you just in a bad place? And brothers and sisters, that's the work of the priest. That's the work of the priest. That's the work of our priest, our heavenly, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he does for us. He comes along and he says, wow, you're doing really well. But there are a few branches here which aren't producing, so let's just snip those off. And it's an act of love. And he comes back next year and there's more fruit. And he goes, that's fantastic. But there's still some little challenges over here, so we'll just work on those. And it's an act of love. And so, brothers and sisters, as we come to the table of our Lord and we consider the wondrous love and the blessings that have been given to us in heavenly realms, let us strengthen ourselves and have confidence in the power of our heavenly Father to complete in us the work he started. You're good enough. You are complete. Because God has completed you. You are holy because God has made you holy. And on that basis, brothers and sisters, we need to go forth and live holy, righteous, and faithful lives. And so as we consider the table, brothers and sisters, and we think about our lives in the last week and we plan our lives for the coming week, let us do so in the confidence in God's love and his grace and his compassion.